Good evening, Lance Conrad here, head of school at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Um, I'm actually at this very moment, my wife and I are hosting a reception for our 11th grade parents and guardians at our home. But I wanted to reach out and say hello, welcome you to CHCH. At CHCH, we really want students to be the best versions of themselves in all different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, the way we approach this oftentimes is asking that first question, not how smart you are, but how are you smart? Um, and getting students to start that metacognitive journey about thinking about how they are as learners and how they learn. Um, and we often look at Howard Gardner's work in the multiple intelligences, that theory, to think about different frameworks of intelligence. Um, and how that then translates into teaching and learning at CHCH, that pedagogical approach is through differentiated learning instruction, where we challenge students in particular areas of strength, looking at their passions, their aptitudes, um, things that they really do well, and making sure that we leverage those in the classroom. There's a lot to learn, and I hope that you're going to enjoy your time with us um, on this virtual open house. I'm now going to toss things over to our Director of Enrollment Management, Lisa Paul Ryan. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Pellrein, Director of Enrollment Management here at CHCH. Welcome everyone. We're happy to have uh, a, a good group tonight to join us for our virtual open house. I'm just going to quickly walk us through our agenda for this evening. Um, first, we're going to be doing um, a couple of presentations, one with uh, academics uh, in our skills and academic and strategies program. And then Kelly Walsh will be talking about our the launch of our middle school beginning fall 2023 um, with our eighth grade class. And then finally, Brooke Fink, our Director of College Counseling, will be doing a presentation um, on our college counseling program. We have two students joining us this evening as well. And I will encourage everybody as we go through uh, this presentation this evening to start putting your questions in the Q&A at any point. I'm going to be keeping track of all the questions. And then as we wrap up, the presentations, I'll be going through each of the questions and asking our panelists to answer those um, for us. So again, welcome. I'm going to throw things over to Josh Bubar to get us started tonight. Over to you, Josh. Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Bubar. I'm the assistant head of school here at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. This is my 22nd year at the school. And I had, began here as the English department chair and a dorm parent, coaching a couple of sports, um, lived here on campus for about a decade with my family. Um, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit about uh, everything that we do here with our students, just not college counseling, because I'll leave that to the expert um, that you'll have a little later. Um, <clears throat> As you take a look here, kind of our fast facts, um, we have about 190 students this year. Um, our average class size is around 10. That's typically our classes are a little bit smaller in our ninth and 10th grade, and they get a little progressively larger through the 11th and 12th grade. Uh, we've won, I think, now 16 league championships. We just won our, uh, I think, our fourth league championship in volleyball this past week. Um, that was pretty exciting. Um, and we do offer a number of unique AP advanced and honors level classes, um, primarily for our juniors and seniors. Uh, the phrase that I think you heard Lance talk about was achieve your best. Uh, and that's what we want to think about with our students. And you'll see here in this presentation uh, the use of you and your a lot, because really we're aiming at what is appropriate for our students. What is their best um, as we work our way through there, as they work their way through uh, their experience here at Chapel Hill. Uh, we really want to work to unlock their potential. Uh, what can they do and who can they become are central questions to our work with them. One of the ways that we think we do that best is through um, kind of our daily schedule. We've been operating this way for about a decade now. We find it incredibly powerful um, for our students and our teachers. You can see here that our classes are 75 minutes long. Uh, and I'm guessing if, if you're like any other group of parents that we speak with um, in the admissions process, you're thinking to yourself, there is no way my child can sit through a 75 minute class. And I will tell you, you are 100% correct. There is no way that if your child comes to Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall, they will sit through a 75 minute class because that's really not how we approach things. Part of our differentiated approach to teaching and learning involves finding lots of different ways in every class for a student to hook themselves into the material. And typically that means getting up out of their seats. That means working in groups. It means working alone. It means moving around, finding different ways 
three, four, five different ways that they can find their way into the skill or the understanding that's going on in class that day. You also see here, we have plenty of time for clubs. We have a class meeting um, block built into every other week. That Wednesday afternoon period where you see class meeting and clubs is also becomes on an every other week basis, our student lifetime, where we work on our social emotional learning program and, and engage in a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Sorry, folks, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Um, one of the really nice things about our 75 minute block as well is that we can do a lot of really different programming here. Um, this is a photo of our recent Senate simulation. Um, the vast majority of our 11th and 12th grade took part in our Senate simulation where each one of the students took, the, took on the role of a sitting US Senator. Um, they caucused with their party, they debated bills, um, they voted, and really got a real live sense of what does it mean to be a senator? What are the issues at hand? What, what do some folks who may not believe exactly the same thing you believe, why do they vote the way they vote? Um, why do they believe the things they believe? And we, we found it, and this is the kind of thing that's really powerful and you're able to do and dig into over the course of multiple weeks, culminating in this day because of our 75 minute block. Another really positive aspect of having 75 minutes um, is in our skills and academic strategies program. Uh, many, many students here participate in this. It's a class in and of itself. It's one of our six blocks, um, A through F in the week for students. And in skills and academic strategies, we're really focusing on three key areas for students. The first is the development of academic skills. So students are working on note-taking skills. They're working on how to generate outlines for papers or graphic organizers. Um, they're working on reading um, and annotating reading, whether that might be a textbook or a novel or a play or a piece of poetry. Um, so really core academic skills that are being taught in our content area classrooms, but then being reinforced in, in our skills and academic strategies department. Another key element of skills and academic strategies is our focus on executive functions. And so we really dig in with students around time management, um, organization of materials, thinking about the get ready, do, done trio um, that allows our students to really think about well, how do I attack this assignment? What do I need to take it on? How do I know when I'll be done? And what is that final step um, involved in getting it to that teacher so that that teacher can assess my, my evidence of learning? We also work with our students on becoming independent learners. And I use that term a little bit loosely because nobody really learns independently. We know that. Um, I'm sure all of us on this call at one time or another encountered something we needed to know, we needed to learn, and we probably didn't do it without some help. But what we, what we all know is, as more mature learners, how to get the help that we need when we need it. And that's a key element of skills and academic strategies, really teaching our students how to ask for help, when to ask for help, and to ask those really key questions that drill down into what kind of help do I need, rather than just showing up on a teacher's doorstep and saying, I don't get it. Um, and we find that our students leave our skills and academic strategies department with a real sense of how to advocate for themselves as who they are as a learner and get what they need to move their learning forward. Another thing we talk about here is creating your story. And so many of our students create their story, not just in the classroom with us, but in our co-curricular program. All of our students take part in co-curriculars here, three trimesters a year. Um, and for some of our students, that means taking part in interscholastic sport. Uh, for some of our students, that means taking part in our theater. We also have our rock climbing program and our podcasting program. Um, but what I think is best about the create your own story aspect of our co-curricular program is how I think a lot of students find something about themselves they didn't even know. Um, you know, this young woman, when she came to Chapel Hill, had never really held a softball bat. And by the time she was a senior, she led the conference in batting average. This young man loved backstage work when he came to us had participated in a number of um, theater productions as a theater tech guy. Um, but really didn't envision himself being on stage. And I can guarantee you, this is not the costume we made our tech folks wear um, for his senior show. And it, that's for me the, the most exciting piece about how kids are writing their story here in our co-curricular program. Similarly, we offer a one week um, short class experiential program called Spring Session, 
where our students can engage in all sorts of different mini classes that we offer here in the last week of our school year in May. Um, this one was, if you have a chance to come to campus at some point, you'll see the mural that students made as part of spring session um, that's in our boys' dorm. Um, but we'll do all sorts of things. We'll travel. Um, we'll get on the, the waterways of greater Boston. Um, this year, we're going to have a biking one. It's going to do miles and miles and miles all over the city um, and the suburbs here in the Boston area. We often offer cooking classes, all sorts of ways for kids to really have some fun and learn something new at the end of the year. One other thing we talk with our students about is expressing themselves, becoming the person that they want to be. Um, that's the job of adolescence, right, is to figure out who, who is it that I want to be? How do I want to move forward in this world? Uh, one of the key elements for us of that is our, co is our um, community service program. We do require community service hours of all of our students. And we really find that students can find themselves in service to others. Some of this service is, as you see right here, we sent a whole group of students um, off to the cradles to crayons. They're doing different sorting activities, um, really kind of getting into that. Um, for other students, it's more individualized. Um, so the young woman with her back to us in this picture with the red hair and the green sweater um, loves photography. And so she was able to connect with the Robbins House in Concord, Massachusetts. They needed a photographer for an event that they were having. Um, she loves diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives. She loves photography. It was a match made in heaven. Um, and so that's just another way that I, our kids can really find themselves through service to others. In addition, uh, a lot of our diversity, equity, inclusion work is driven by our students. A few years ago, um, we had a student, Osmara, whose family celebrates the Day of the Dead and creates an ofrenda. Uh, she presented to us. Um, this was actually in the midst of the pandemic, which is why this is kind of, this is her room from home at one point. Um, and that actually led us to, over the past few years, creating our own community ofrenda and really helping our students understand cultural traditions by engaging in them in really authentic ways. We've also had a lot of success pairing with our dining hall. Our dining company, Flick Dining, really wants to dig in with our students, really wants to be involved. And so we brought lots of different students into the kitchen. Um, just last month, um, Luelle and Tony um, brought in, were brought in and they did um, made some dessert, um, arroz con leche, and a lamb stew that was unbelievable. Uh, I heard from the dining hall staff that it was the first time that they didn't have any leftovers the next day to serve um, to students because it just got gobbled up by everybody. And again, it was a chance for our students to express themselves a piece of who they are, a piece of who their family is, um, and, and really be somebody in our community. When it all comes together, we really want our kids to achieve. Um, but we want to achieve them to achieve their best. What do they want from this high school experience? What do they want from their adolescence? Um, and we can be their guides. We can be their helpers. Um, we don't need to tell them what to do, but we can help them be that person that they really want to be. Um, I hope you find that across all these presentations. I'm really looking forward to hearing what questions you have about this. Certainly, there's much, much more to talk about here at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. Um, but I think this gives you a thumbnail sketch of what we have going on here. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, next up, I'm gonna have Kelly Walsh introduce herself and talk about um, our new middle school. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. I'm Kelly Walsh, head of middle school, and I have been at Chapel Hill. This is my seventh year. I previously served as the director of ninth and 10th grade programs, taught in the history department and the French department. And fortunately, I'm still an advisor, so I have currently have 10th grade advisees keeping me engaged in the life of the high school right now while I develop and plan for next year's inaugural class of middle school students at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall, which will be our uh, eighth grade, uh, the class of 2028. And it's an incredibly exciting time for us as we add the middle school to Chapel Hill. Much of what Josh spoke about is still going to guide the work in the middle school but we also know that middle school students have different needs and are not high school students and as such the middle school will have its own home base and that is one of the wonderful things of our program is i'm not waiting for any construction to finish i have a building you can come see it uh, we'll have classrooms there some wonderful flexible space lots of great outdoor space to be moving around 
We will also be hiring full-time teachers to teach core academic classes just in the middle school. It's important that the middle school students have these teachers who are dedicated to their learning needs, who are working with them day in, day out. And at the same time, we know that we want to give these middle school students a chance to spread their wings. And as such, each week we'll incorporate opportunities to take classes in our Visual and Performing Arts Center, as art will be a fundamental component of our weekly schedule. We will also um, go over the hill for lunch every day in the Charger Cafe. Um, and then we will also incorporate our middle school students into our co-curricular program. And for the first year, that's going to be handled on a case by case, family by family, student by student basis with a whole wealth of opportunities available. But there will be some of our co-curriculars where the spaces will be reserved for high school students or where we might say to a student, you're not quite ready there, but you know, when you join our ninth grade in a year from now, we'll be ready for you. Um, it's a really wonderful program. I'm having a terrific time developing and developing the program and working with my colleagues. <clears throat> um, we have a lot of great interest. We actually also have already enrolled our first student in this class of 2028. And I have wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me, upper school tour guides who are helping in this process. And there's so much more I could say right now. Um, but I, this is mostly just an overview and happy to answer questions. But I would also encourage you to visit our middle school events page. In addition to these open houses, we're having weekly drop-ins, very casual. Um, they're Thursday mornings through the winter and families can register to join those or simply if you find yourself in the area and you have time, please feel free to drop into the admissions office and we can give you a tour, answer your questions. I am also happy to meet with anyone, anyone interested in middle school anytime. Um, my job this year is building this program and getting to know our prospective students as they get ready to start the application process. One other piece um, that I wanna highlight in this first year of our middle school program is that we're going with a rolling admissions. And so when a family is ready, they can complete their application, come for a tour and an interview, and then the admissions office and I will get a decision to you much faster than if you were applying to our, our ninth grade or 10th grade. And we're just doing that this year in our first year to get things rolling so that families aren't waiting until March for their decisions. Again, I welcome any questions tonight and would love to have converse, individual conversations with families and tell you more about our program and all the details of our schedule and show you our space. Um, but it's a very exciting time for Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall, and I can't wait to have my first eighth graders in the building next year. It's starting to feel just a little too quiet, um, but I have to wait until September. So uh, please do give me a call, come visit, and I'll look forward to answering your questions later. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, and next, I'd like to introduce our Director of College Counseling, Brooke Fink. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for coming this evening and joining us. My name is Brooke Fink. I am the Director of College Counseling at CHCH. My pronouns are she, her, and I've been here for about 10 years. Um, so I'm going to speak to you briefly about something on the other end of the spectrum from what Kelly just addressed. Um, our college counseling process. So um, we really try to focus our students in their high school experience as being high school students for their first half of their high school career. So ninth and 10th grade are largely spent spending time in your classes, getting to know, as Dr. Conrad said, how you learn, who you are as a learner, um, and finding the situations where you are asking more questions, where you are curious, where you are more excited about doing that homework at night. Um, and really paying attention to those experiences to try to see where you might be curious about shaping your education moving forward. When we do approach the college counseling or post-secondary planning process, as a college prep school, we expect everyone to engage in this process um, for a variety of reasons, but mostly so that you have a really solid schema for figuring out what you want in your educational life and how you want to engage in your education moving forward. And we do that focused on authenticity and simplicity. So we really kind of shape our program around those pillars and focus on developing a relationship with students and with your college counselor um, built on honesty and self-reflection. We use those skills developed in the first two years of high school to have strong and empathic communication. Um, and again, utilize some of those time management and organization skills. I strongly believe that this process should not consume you 
We want to ensure that this is a piece of the process for you as you move through your education and not the entire thing. Um, and as we are paying attention to that first half of high school very carefully, when students start to transition into the second half of high school, they're ready to do this because it's really been built into the program that they're doing. A lot of the feedback I get from colleges is that our students enter college knowing how to learn and knowing how they learn. So they are able to walk into a learning environment in college, be able to assess that situation and sort of figure out, okay, these are the tools I developed in high school and here's how I employ them in a college setting. So we focus that process, again, the next piece, in finding your fit. We want to ensure that our student, students are really thinking about the criteria that are important to them. What have they learned about themselves as learners, as community members? What are their goals and ambitions? Um, what sort of environment do they feel like they thrive in? And what sort of resources and opportunities are going to be important to them as they move forward in their education? Um, and that is all about the fit. So we focus that in terms of finding the predictable and unpredictable options, which is my the language I use instead of saying a reach school or a safety school. I like to talk about predictable and unpredictable options um, based on the evidence that students have to provide and colleges history with our community and truly the um, sort of institutional priorities that colleges have, which is largely what determines whether students are admitted or not. It has very little to do with what students have to offer. Um, so if students are finding success in our program, they are likely to find success in any college program. We just have to figure out what does that fit look like? Where is the evidence that they have to present going to align with what colleges are looking for? And where is the community that they're looking for, the opportunities that they're curious about? What has all those options? So really what we're doing is going beyond the name of the college or post-secondary program and focusing on the whole picture. What is that student gonna thrive? Where is that student going to thrive? And then we move into the happiness challenge balance, which is really sort of my favorite part of this. I love working with students in our program because I get to ask them, where do you want to feel supported? Where do you want there to sort of be no change in your experience? And where do you wanna take risks? Where do you want to feel challenged? Where do you want to feel like you can try something new um, without a fear of failure? And they've spent a really good amount of time in our program, in our community, figuring that out within our context. Um, and so they know how to articulate that and find that in their next communities. So I really want our students to be excited about where they're going, again, regardless of what that name is, or even regardless of how predictable the option is, by the time that we're working together, they should build a list that's based on programs that they're really interested in um, and have that happiness challenge balance. Because we know that in the end, where you go doesn't matter, what you do there does. We want our students to graduate from college with a robust resume of experiences and skills that are gonna make a difference in the world around them and allow them to achieve their goals and as we've been saying, reach their potential. So a general timeline of how we do that. Again, the first half of high school should be spent being a high school student. But in the spring of 10th grade, we offer an ACT SAT comparison test to our 10th graders. We do that to give students some autonomy in that standardized testing process. The landscape has changed so much in the past 20 years, 10 years, and specifically the last three years um, that we want to give students the power to make decisions for themselves. If standardized testing is something that they are amazing at, fantastic. Let's figure out what the best plan is to develop a strong portfolio of testing that they can use in the college process. If standardized testing is something that nauseates your student, which I've been told several times that it can. Um, we want to make sure that they are empowered to then focus on a different piece of the evidence that they're bringing to the table for colleges to highlight who they are and what they can do in that process. And it all starts with helping them figure out for themselves, with our help, of course, and our being me and you, the family, um, and the other constituents at the table, um, to make a plan for standardized testing. So that happens in the spring of 10th grade. And then I don't really pop back in again until um, next month in the winter of 11th grade, December. I go into the English classes to, in concert with our English department, deliver the college essay workshop and start working on that piece together. We do that to help build those authentic relationships. I like to approach teenagers from the side. I think that sometimes if you approach a teenager head on, you can spook them. And I don't want to do that with students. Um, so we start with the college essay process, really kind of talking about this very different piece of writing that our students are going to be doing and a very important piece of writing that they're going to be doing. We help them start to figure out who are you going to be in a college community and how can we show colleges that. 
So that's the winter of 11th grade. Um, further in the winter, we have our post-secondary planning night or our college night in January. And that is the official transition, the official launch of the post-secondary planning process. All of our juniors and their families attend. They get access to the single piece of writing that will change their lives forever, the College Counseling Handbook, um, and access to our college counseling software. It's called SCORE. Um, and that is when we start our individual and family meetings to really start that planning process and to start to identify the criteria that are important to everybody in the process. Um, it's important to me and to our community to empower students to be in the driver's seat of this process, but we also acknowledge that they're not the only people in the car, um, that there are a lot of people vying for temperature control and radio control, and are we using AC, are we using windows? Um, so everybody's voices need to be heard, and it's part of my job to facilitate that process. Um, I speak fluent teenager. I haven't met a dialect or dialogue that I haven't been able to interpret, um, and it's all part of the fun in serving as that translator for all of you. Finally, when we're well on the way, in August before senior year, I run the College Counseling Boot Camp. I've been told many times I'm not allowed to require students to do push-ups, which is not to say that push-up contests don't ensue, but it is not that kind of boot camp. This is a dedicated amount of time before classes start so that seniors can get as much of their applications finished before school starts as possible. We want to have a solid plan and a strategy for completing applications to meet early deadlines if that's a priority and to take some of that stress off the process for our seniors. So that's a brief timeline of how this all works, um, but my favorite part is the results or the outcome. Our students have incredibly varied interests. They have incredibly different values in terms of what's important to them and what they want to pursue and how they identify their potential and what they want to reach it. So that means they apply to, are accepted at, and enroll at an extremely wide range of post-secondary programs. Everything from the smallest, I can see I'm on like looking at the screen to see some of those names. Um, Everything from the smallest colleges in the tip of Maine to huge public universities in Southern California, um, even colleges abroad across in Europe and Japan and in Canada, our students are enrolling everywhere. But most importantly, they are finding their fit and they are figuring that out and they are understanding the power they have in choosing their happiness and choosing their outcome. Um, and so this is just a brief list of what some of those opportunities can look like. I hope you all stick around for the Q&A and I'm happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Great, thanks so much, Brooke. Um, before we introduce our students and get into the Q&A, um, I just wanna show a short video and it's uh, some of our teachers reading a current testimonial from one of our current parents. Um, parents like you, um, you know, have gone through this process and, you know, really just want to, um, just get a feel of what the school is like. So I just wanna offer at any point during the process as well. Um, we have a parent ambassador program and many parents would be happy to speak to you at any point, but just wanted to share this um, one quick video this evening with you all. To our phenomenal, inspiring, dedicated, talented, thoughtful, and kind CHCH adults. What a year it has been. Through it all, you've led with grace, cultivated opportunities for exploration and growth, encouraged our daughter to try new things and to dig deeper. You have provided an environment that allows her to become herself more fully. It's kind of an incredible thing to watch your child create her identity within the safe boundaries of a nurturing and supportive atmosphere. Created by and surrounded by a group of wonderful adults. We love to hear snippets from your conversations the jokes, smiles, and even tears. We value the relationships she has developed with all of you and are grateful that you are able to help her push through her fears and doubts. Celebrate her successes and encourage her to try new things. You're all helping to shape a generation of change makers. From heartfelt conversations to helping navigate really hard social stuff. From sharing articles and podcasts to diving down deep historical rabbit holes. From promoting the responsibility of intelligent women to smash patriarchal expectations, to encouraging deep exploration of unexpected areas of interest. From hugs to high expectations, you all show up in a big way. Every child needs at least one charismatic adult in their life, and ours has an entire school full. 
it doesn't get any better than that. Thank you. Thank you. I still get the chills every time I see that. I hope um, you felt that as well. Um, before we get into the Q&A, and thank you so much for all of the many, many wonderful questions. Um, we have two students joining us this evening, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, talk about where, um, where they, what school they came from previously from CHCH, how long they've been here, um, they are boarding, and some of the um, co-curricular activities that you've participated in. Um, so Agamemnon, I'm gonna have you go first. Okay, um, my, okay, okay. Um, my name is Agamemnon Alexopoulos and my previous school I went to was Carroll. Um, and I've been at Chapel Hill for, this is my third year, I'm a junior this year. And some of the co-curriculars I participated in um, was fitness and then I have baseball and yeah. Awesome, thanks Agamemnon and Lois. Hi, I'm Lois. I'm a junior, um, my third year here. Um, I'm from New Jersey. My previous school was William McCollum School 22. Um, in Elizabeth, I participated in basketball and softball. Great. And Lois is a boarding student. So if you have any questions from that perspective, I'm sure she'd be happy to answer that. Um, so I've taken all of your questions and I've kind of grouped them together. And the first one is um, kind of three, three parts. Um, so this parent was wondering, how do we handle IEP situations? Um, do you work with MCAS as well? And then how do you provide social emotional learning for your students? So I don't know um, who wants to tackle those Josh, questions. I mean, it's, I'll start it and then I'll, I'll dive into my past role and get that started, but it also applies to middle school. Um, so for our admissions process, we the more information a family can provide to us, the better. And it's not because we're looking to, um, we just, it, the transparency is incredibly helpful for us. So we don't require standardized testing, but IEPs, educational testing, neuropsych testing is all very valuable information for us. Um, MCAS can often be helpful, um, although we're not, a, we're not a big standardized testing school as Brooke shared. And you know, MCAS ha has had its issues the last few years. Um, so certainly it can be a helpful benchmark, um, but when we look to admit a, school, a student to our program, our director of skills and academic strategies creates a learning profile. And every single one of our students has a learning profile, regardless of whether they come to us with a 504 or an IEP. And that learning profile will reflect strengths and weaknesses in the student's learning um, you know, the way they learn, and then will be added to as the student goes through their time here with hints and suggestions and recommendations. We also help families keep their IEPs in their public school districts. So a member of our skills and academic strategies uh, team would meet with an IEP team in a, in a local public district and keep that IEP going. I'll be honest, most of what most of the recommendations on the IEPs that we see are things that happen for all of our students every day. And so we don't have to make a lot of changes for your student to, to have those accommodations. Um, but the IEPs can be helpful and certainly moving into the college testing landscape to have the um, updated IEP and our learning profile may have um, some accommodations there that are helpful in the process as you move forward. Great. So no, I, no MCAS. You do not have to take the MCAS while you're Oh, yeah. We don't take them here. Oh, no. Yeah, no. Which is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Brooke, do you want to add anything else about kind of your your process with kind of keeping that updated testing and how it's valuable for you as you're going through and helping students with standardized tests? Sure. So um, keeping your kind of three-year cycle of updating your neuropsych is critically important to both getting accommodations that you might need, like extra time on standardized testing that might not be typical, like an AP test, which we do offer. So we want to make sure that those are up to date um, for, for AP tests here. But also, if you want accommodations or supports in college, we do want to keep that updated. Um, and we work closely with families in that process to ensure that whatever accommodations are important for the student to achieve success and reach their potential are going to be aligned with what they want in college as well. Great. Thank you. And Josh, do you want to talk about um, the social emotional learning piece? Yeah, absolutely. So our social emotional learning program um, is mostly directed by Neil Hagen, who's our director of counseling and wellness here. 
and focuses on a couple of different areas. Particularly, we like we like our kids to think about empathy. We think empathy is, is a muscle that you can build, and we really work with our kids to understand themselves and understand others and expand their circle of concern. That is, you know, the folks that they really care about and, and can feel for. Um, we also want to work with our kids about kind of making healthy choices. Um, and those are in relationships and in personal choices they make. Um, as, as Brooke noted in her presentation, uh, we tend to approach students a little bit sideways. Sometimes it's a little head on, heads on, but um, often sideways is the way to have a conversation that can be really meaningful for an adolescent around some of these ideas about healthy choices. So uh, we dig in with that over the course of our, typically over the course of a four-year progression with a student. You know, certainly we have students who come to us in 10th or 11th grade, and um, those are students who are going to get, they don't get the benefit of the entire program, um, certainly, but certainly we, we work with them as well. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, the next question, I'm sorry, Kelly, if you answered this during your um, presentation, I was writing down all the questions I might have missed. It. Um, we would be applying for eighth grade. How many students are you planning on enrolling? Sure. So our ideal number for the first class of eighth grade is going to be 20. Uh, we can take up to 24. And then in terms of, you know, the lower end, um, which I don't like to think about because I know we're going to have a wonderful class, uh, we do have a cutoff in probably around 14. Um, I think for it to be a healthy and engaging and um, wonderful program, we don't want to be too small um, as we get started, but we're aiming for 20. 24 and then our ninth grade is typically between 36 and 40 and then our 10th grade grows again so this is all keep in line with um, who we are at, at our 190 in 190 to 200 in the high school great thank you next question my child is a multiracial uh, asian black hispanic what is the diversity of chch josh do you want to sure yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I do think that we're a very diverse community. Um, roughly 40% um, of our students identify um, as students of color, um, and many of them identify as multiracial, so that certainly wouldn't be um, unusual for us to have a student with that profile here. We work pretty hard, again, around empathy and really digging into issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I think while those can be uncomfortable conversations, um, our director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, Nikki Turpin, uh, you know, always uses the, we need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, and we need to be able to have these conversations and, and treat each other civilly and treat each other with care and respect um, as we talk about the things that unite us and the things that make us unique. I would also just add that in terms of representation in the community, that that's been a real focus um, for the last several years. And we are working, continuing to work towards increasing the diversity and experiences of our faculty and staff um, and are, are um, growing each year and currently are around, I think we figured it was between 20 and 25% of our faculty and staff identify as people of color. Great. Thank you both. Next question, do you ever have outside groups come in for clubs and organizations? Hmm. I'm not quite sure which clubs and organizations. Um, we do, we, we have had a, um, a Dungeons and Dragons club that was started last year by a student. And then he lobbied for us to bring in an outside dungeon master. So we've been having that happen on a weekly basis. Not quite weekly, probably every other week basis at this point through the fall. Um, and we do occasionally for our athletics, we will have um, external coaches. So our, our boys soccer team and our girls volleyball team this year both have external coaches. You, that's his folks who do nothing but coach for us. Um, but we actually are really happy that all of our other coaches and activity leaders are folks who work here and you know they'll teach during the day and then they'll go and run our theater program at night or coach basketball or, or engage with our kids in a whole other way. Can I put Lois on the spot for a minute? Lois, am I correct? Um, I don't know if it's in your time, but that SOCA has had some outside visitors and speakers join them. Stu SOCA is our Students of Color Alliance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, we've had uh, speakers come in for SOCA. Um, it's not uh, like something unusual. It's actually very great, uh, the like clarity that we all get, just hearing things that are like not campus based and kind of like connect to the real world it's really nice but yeah we do have speakers for some great thank you uh, and someone's also asking can you speak about the music program 
and maybe how that's incorporated into the schedule. Um, I can do music. I took. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so I took chamber ensemble for two years. Um, I played an instrument, well, multiple instruments outside of school for a long time. So coming into chamber ensemble was just like something I was just used to. Um, I know that we do have guitar and piano classes. So I think those classes are more for students who want to learn more like on how to play a certain instrument or just, you know, just expand instruments that they already played. Um, me already coming in with knowledge of um, playing an instrument. Uh, chamber Ensemble, which is a good class for me to just dive right into and just play music. So, yeah. That's great. And we also have the vocal ensemble as well. Yep. Uh, for sports, specifically volleyball, how can someone who doesn't have experience learn? And I think this applies to all of our sports. Um, Josh, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah. I mean, our sports, we, we have a no cut policy for our sports. And so everybody has a team they can play on. And what that typically means in our sports, like for example, volleyball, where we have a number of girls that play, we have a JV team and a varsity team. And while our varsity team is very competitive, um, they're the number two seed in Class C in New England this year going to the tournament. Our JV team is definitely a place where girls learn how to play volleyball. And we have a number of girls playing on our varsity team right now who played JV when they were when they first came to Chapel Hill Sonsi Hall. And so it can be not just a place to learn to play and a place to make friends and have fun, but also a place where you can, if you want to, develop into a stronger player who can contribute to a championship caliber varsity program. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you have any financial aid? Um, so yes, we do offer need-based financial aid um, beginning from eighth grade on up. Um, the deadline for financial aid is January 15th. And so if you go to our website under the admission section, um, affording CHCH, um, there's a whole section there with um, our policies and procedures. Uh, if you have any questions at all on financial aid specifically, you can feel free to reach out to the admissions office. Um, but it is important to get everything in by January 15th. And we read um, applications and make decisions um, throughout the month of February. And then we take those students who are accepted and also applied for financial aid. We make those decisions after. And everything is sent out on March 10th including um, your decision as well as financial aid decisions. We do offer scholarships as well for ninth, um, for a couple for eighth grade and also for ninth grade applicants. You do not need to apply for those, um, but as the admissions committee goes through the application process and review reviews those applications, we, we kind of identify students we feel like um, would meet the criteria of those um, scholarships as well. Okay. Back up. Um, can you speak uh, to how day students and boarding students are able to socialize after school on weekends? And I do just want to mention the next question is how many day versus boarding students? And an ideal year, we do have about 60% day students um, and 40% boarding students. And um, we have a day and a boarding student uh, each represented here in our panel. So if you both want to just kind of talk about how you interact the length of the day and how that's a little bit different than public school and then options for, for weekends. So I don't know who wants to tackle that one first, Lois or Agamemnon. I mean, okay, I guess I can go first. Um, so like, I mean, you see them during the day, they're obviously in your classes and all that stuff. Um, but like on the weekends, there's like weekend, weekend activities. Like um, for example, like at the beginning of October, they had uh, um, like a horror movie thing where we could all go and see like uh, the movie Smile when it first came out. We went to go see the movie. Um, and so like a bunch of the boarding students and a couple of day students came in and uh, we all watched the movie. It was, it was fun. Uh, it was a scary movie, but it was good. But um, yeah, then they have like, uh, I think they've had paintball in the past, like, um, you know, move like um, obviously other movies um, and stuff like that. But, you ever come early for breakfast or stay for dinner? I give them none as uh, yeah, yeah, I always come early for breakfast. Um, Sometimes I like I don't really stay for dinner, but like if I can, I will try to. But mm -hmm. yeah, okay, great. So that's open for all for all day and boarding students: breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Lois, do you want to add anything as well for your interaction with your boarding friends and day friends as well? So I've said it before, like in different panels, but. I find it that my day student friends don't particularly leave me alone. Um, <laughs> they are here a lot on the weekends. And I think 
it's like like just now like we just came back from watching the new black panther movie mm-hmm. guys go please watch that movie with okay. <laughs> but um i would say that there's a lot of room for interaction on the weekends that you expect like during the week sometimes it happens sometimes it doesn't it really just depends on the week but i would say that the weekends are just a time for everyone to like on campus off campus like everyone talks to each other everyone sees each other um and it's like you don't have to force anyone to do it like there are some mandatory Mm. events sometimes but you'll find that day students are on campus like without the little push and shove but yeah yeah great thank you both um Next question is, what is the reason to board versus not board? What do the students see as the advantage or disadvantages of boarding? So Lois, do you have an advantage point of being a boarding student and how it's been helping you over the past three years? I'd say a pretty big advantage point is that I don't live in this state. So I kind of do <laughs> But um, I like the, I like being independent and I feel like the boarding program offers that a lot because I don't know, I feel like it also really depends um, for the person. Um, mm-hmm. But coming from my perspective, me being like the oldest of four, I just find that it's very easy for me to be independent in general. And I like I like operating that way, I like thriving that way. So just being a boarder is just ideal for me because I'm able to set my own pace, able to do everything that I need to do. Um, yeah. Great. And we're actually having um, a webinar for families next week because we have some day students that are interested in transitioning to boarding. Um, so that happens as well. Sometimes a student will, as a freshman, start off as a, as a day student. Parents are kind of not ready to let go quite yet, um, but the student ends up spending so much time on campus or you know, from an academic perspective, having study hall Sunday through Thursday night for two hours, um, proctored and monitored by the dorm parents and student resident assistants, um, I think it's definitely an advantage point. So that's something that we see as well with with students starting off as day and transitioning to boarding. Um, The next question, could a student in uh, currently in 10th grade at another school join mid-year if accepted? Um, So yes, it all depends on if at this point, if we can make that student a schedule. Um, So if you are interested in looking at a possible mid-year transfer, you could email me directly and we can talk about that process and getting um, a transcript and and kind of talking about the application process. Um, This week, we are ending our first trimester and beginning the second trimester after Thanksgiving break, um, which we do already have um, a few students joining us both for, for ninth and 10th grade. So happy to answer that specifically for you. If you want to um, email me directly, I'm happy to assist you with that as well. Um, let's see, community groups like Cat Connection or Girl Scouts or even other local groups. Um, do we have any connections with some of those organizations? So we don't necessarily have connections with Girl Scouts or Scouts, um, but a having read all these college applications, I can tell you that many of our students continue to maintain those relationships and participate in those organizations. Um, And in fact, sometimes we'll bring opportunities that they learn about in those those organizations to campus for community service activities um, and vice versa, bringing stuff out. I'd also jump in to say in the realm of community service and service projects, I've had students who are doing projects with scouts or with some other organization, um, a religious school or something outside of school, and they'll ask if they have to do if they have to separate their service. And so we have a service hour requirement each year. Um, and I say, no, we're going to let you double dip if we know that you're you're doing these 15 hours of service Um you can get credit from us and get credit from another organization. But as Brooke said, there's off, off, often a lot of overlap there too. Um, next question is for the students. Um, if you could talk a little bit about your transition from your previous school into the CHC community and how that felt for, for each of you. Lois, do you want to go first then Agamemnon? So I would say that the transition from a bigger school, my school being about like, I don't know, over a thousand kids. Um, I knew that I needed a smaller school just for me to be able to like feel like my own person and just again just be independent. Um the transition, I thought that, well, actually, it's a little different for me because COVID times kind of I was on my laptop, but it's okay. Um I would think 
I would not, I would say that it actually made it a lot more different, um, being that I was on Zoom for a couple of months and then transitioning again mm -hmm. to being in person. Um, it was different. It took some adjusting to like, you know, being that I was seeing new people that like, you know, I had seen in class, but I didn't really know who they were. Um, but it didn't take long for me to adjust. It was just something that kind of just naturally happened. Um, and I find it, it was just, it's just very helpful to be in a smaller environment. I think particularly with classes, um, just being able to have like a one-on-one, -on -one, like being able to have one-on-one -on -one time with your teachers is taken for granted sometimes I think um, just because I'm able to get that extra help if I do need it and just always having the option to like ask for extra help because that wasn't always an option in my old school is kind of just um, 30 of you are in this class I have a class in two minutes so you need to go and you know it's just like not much you can do about that but having that type of transition from public to private school was just great. Thank you, Willis. Agamemnon, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I mean, my transition was pretty good because, like, my old school was, like, pretty similar to Chapel Hill. It was relatively small, um, so I kind of got used to it. The only main difference was that the classes were a lot longer, but mm -hmm. they, they didn't really seem that way when I was in the classroom because we got to move around. We got to interact with the, like, the teacher, the other students, and so it wasn't that bad. It was pretty good overall. Good. <laughs> Um, do sports meet every day after school? Um, so Jess, you want to talk about the co-curricular requirement and how you have an option between sports and other other things? Sure, and, and I see, I think the same person asked about a swim team. So maybe Agamemnon, you want to talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about the big picture. Maybe you talk about your experience. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our, our co-curriculars do meet every day after school, five days a week um, with occasional weekend commitments once, maybe twice a trimester. Um, we and those, those practices are typically an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the sport and the level. Um, our JV groups will sometimes go a little bit shorter. Our varsity group will go a little bit longer. Um, the, the end of the typical day is between 5.30 and 6. That's the absolute latest in the fall and the spring. It can end a little bit later in the winter. We have four basketball teams rotating through one gym space. And so while we share and overlap, um, those do get done a little bit later on, particularly on Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, which are our late days. Um, we do compete in a couple of different athletic leagues. And so if, you're, if you have a student who's playing a sport, um, they will have away games from time to time, and those will get back. Often those are back by dinner time, um, maybe right at the end of dinner, and, and we certainly will hold dinner for students um, if they're coming back within a reasonable time. Um, and then our other co-curriculars, theater, for example, or podcasting or rock climbing, those also meet five days a week. Um, we don't have a swim team, but we do offer students who have um, strong interest in something that we don't offer the chance to do what we call an independent study in our co-curricular program. And actually Agamemnon might be a perfect person to talk about that a little bit. Um, so yeah, I do swimming outside of school. Um, freshman year, I didn't. I did like fitness for the first two trimesters, then I did baseball. Then my sophomore year, I wanted to see if I could do swimming and like pursue that um, instead. And so uh, they gave me, I think, for two, out of all three trimesters, two of the trimesters, I was able to swim, uh, which makes it really good. And even like uh, like last year in the spring trimester, um, I was still able to swim throughout the whole thing. I just had I got to do like I did like podcasting, um, which was fun. And I still got to the swim as well. So, you know, you still get an opportunity to do like your outside sport as long as it meets certain requirements for it. Great. Thank you, Agamemnon. Um... And I just want to emphasize again, if um, theater counts as a as a team sport, so some of our students might do um, the performing arts program all three trimesters. Some might do um, a fall sport, the musical in the winter, and then another sport in the spring. So a lot of our students kind of overlap with that. Um, we do not offer any shuttle or bus service for day students um, because we we have students coming from kind of a 30 mile radius of Waltham. But what we do um, provide is um, contact information for all of the day um, families and where they're from. And many of our students, especially in the morning, will coordinate carpools together. Um, and then oftentimes after school, depending on the co-curriculars that they do. Um, can you speak about the academic support for a student with dyslexia and what is your academic support like? 
Josh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, the, so our academic support is the Skills and Academic Support Program, and that will meet um, typically for our ninth and 10th graders three times a week for 75 minutes. Uh, it's essentially broken up into two sections. There will be a 20 to 30 minute section at the beginning of the class that will uh, have a lesson. And the lesson might center on executive function. It might center on a particular academic skill that the students in the ninth grade or the 10th grade are using particularly in that moment. So for example, I know we will typically teach some note-taking and reteach some note-taking skills when our students are writing a research paper in history, for example, in, the, in their SAS class. Um, really, it's also about for students to figure out how do they approach things well. So there's a lot of metacognitive work. There's a lot of us asking students to reflect on the work that they've done, how they approached it, how they might approach it differently when they do it again, because again, many of the assignments that students take on will be repeated. Um, there will be other writing assignments. There'll be other presentations. There'll be other podcasts put together. Um, I don't know if, if either Lois or Agamemnon, you want to talk about the, the academic support in SAS at all? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so I have dyslexia. I came from a school, Carol, which was also to help kids with dyslexia and dyscalculia. Um, and basically, like SAS, uh, the program helped me a ton with like organizers, taking notes, and it helps me like all around through all, all, all my classes. Uh, I like I have a history essay um, that's due, I think, at the end of the week. And my SAS teachers like helped me pick away at it slowly and sort of figure out how to use my organizer correctly to make it sort of flow together so it doesn't sound really choppy. Um, but yeah, so it's the like, uh, Chapel Hill is like awesome for um, just like working with kids with like learning disabilities and stuff like that. So. Great. Thank you. Um, one question is, um, conflicts between students happen in all schools. How does CHCH teach students how to manage conflict? I'll just say this because I heard Casey American Horse, who's our ninth grade class dean, say this at several open houses. And then I think Josh and Kelly can maybe jump in. Um, but part of our ninth grade program is a very intentional in, in our weekly class meetings, they're really focused on communication and how to communicate with each other. So actively teaching students, how do we communicate with each other? What are appropriate ways to communicate? How do we build these authentic and trusting relationships with each other? And where do those responsibilities lie? So it's a really sort of um, intentional focused transitioning to a high school community and starting to build those relationship skills early on and communication skills early on, specifically for a small community like ours. So that's one way we're sort of addressing that is by teaching skills coming in and then I'll jump in. One thing that we haven't touched much on um, is our advisory program, and that is a place where every um, student is matched up with an advisor each academic year because our advisors themselves work in grade level teams. And so what Casey, our dean, is referring to is that you know, the ninth grade might see that there are some social conflicts bubbling up. And so as a team, they'll decide that in advisory, it might be time to tackle that and have some conversations in, in much smaller groups where it's it's not a classroom setting. Um, there's no grading. It's just an opportunity to connect and to chat. Um, I also think that in our classrooms and Agamemnon and Lois, because they were both in my history class last year, you can challenge me on this or we can go back and forth a little bit. But I think we also present to our students different ways to agree and to disagree with one another and present from a history, you know, as a history teacher, present scenarios and situations in history where people have struggled to figure things out. And we explore those and look at those together as a class and um, see that not everybody always gets along, but how can we figure that out and how can we be civil with one another? Anything to add, Lois or Agamemnon? You know, one challenge. <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to. Um, there was one question um, that I skipped over. I apologize. Clubs are not mandatory, but encouraged. And um, the majority of our clubs are student driven. So if there is a um, something of interest, your student, um, you know, wants to explore more, um, and we don't offer it, um, you can always start a club or partner with other students to kind of expand a club. So there's a lot of opportunity that way as well. Um, we do not offer any dance classes, but I know we've had clubs in the past um, where students have interest in dance. Um, and then also, again, with the independent study, if there's something that a student wants to um, ask for an independent study for one trimester to continue doing something out of school, um, they've done 
dance in the past as well. Um, another question, is there a speech and debate program? Do you want to tackle that one? We have a student um, working to initiate a speech and debate club that has had various iterations over the past few years. Um, Great. And I know a lot of that happens within classes as well. So, yeah. Josh, I'm sorry I cut you. I felt like I cut you off. There's... No, I was going to say, no, I was going to say exactly what Kelly said. I, we also have had students in the past um, begin us, uh, get us involved with Model UN. Um, and mm -hmm. that typically waxes and wanes with student interest. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about the senior presentation as well? Uh, sure. So we talk, I'm the, sorry, I don't think we talked about that yet. So that's kind of no. Um, one of the pieces of our academic program is that all of our seniors um, do a presentation of some type to a large group of our community, often the whole community, in which they're talking about something that really matters to them. Um, and it could be anything from just a very straightforward more formal talk. We have uh, in our assembly hall, there's a podium. We often have seniors who'll stand up at the podium and just deliver a talk that's 10 or 15 minutes long. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a student who said, uh, well, they told me I had to talk about myself. So he talked about himself for a couple of minutes and then he played guitar in the faculty student band that he had put together and they played three or four numbers and it was great. And so really that's what we want from our students in the senior presentation is showing us a piece of themselves that maybe we've seen a little glimpses of here and there, or maybe not, and, and kind of opening themselves up to our community even a little more. Great. I know we're um, over our time. There's just a couple more questions I just want to get to really quick, um, and then we can finish finish up. Um, one of the questions uh, is, is there a time at the end of the day students for students to meet with their teachers for extra help if needed. So in addition to our skills and academic strategies program, we have office hours built into our schedule four days a week after first period um, for about a half hour um, for um, the first trimester for ninth and I believe 10th graders now. Um, we make it um, mandatory for them to see a specific teacher each of those four days. Um, but it's it's just really to get them into the habit and routine of knowing their teachers are available for them. And um, it's always available all four years um, for them to be able to access um, their teachers. So like Lois said, sometimes, you know, in public school, teachers didn't have enough time or after after school, there were 30 kids there. Um, so I think our office hour schedule um, works really well. And then the weekly progress reports, our teachers provide our students every Tuesday during advisory. Parents have access to those on Wednesday. So there's a lot of feedback and opportunities for students to interact with, with their teachers as well. Um, then there's the last question I want to want to cover. And please, um, if you have other questions we didn't get to today, um, feel free to email me. And if you have questions for any of the panelists, I can get you their email addresses as well. Um, last question, do you teach mindfulness and or ways to keep peaceful work with anxiety amidst a full school schedule? So I know that's done partly right, Kelly, student life program. Kelly, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I know that's sweet. Oh, yeah, no. So, um, we do, and it, it happens in a lot of different ways, and sometimes it's not uh, terribly prescribed. Um, in my own classes um, in the past few years, I start each lesson each day with something a little different. Sometimes it's trivia, sometimes it's music, sometimes it's just deep breathing, um, but it's just a chance to literally catch your breath. And we also, um, I think as a community, we we know how to take care of each other and we also look out for each other and encourage each other to take care of oneself. And so there are opportunities, whether it's during the day, during the week, um, to connect with your advisor and just catch your breath or go for a walk or take a break. Um, and it, that's just part of, of who we are. So it's not that a bell rings and everybody sits down and has to do you know, meditation for 10 minutes and then off we go again. Um, it just happens a little bit more naturally. And sometimes we need help with that, but um, mostly it, it, it is built into our day and into our community. And our counselors are wonderful and supportive and are always there for students to drop in and just get a reset if they need that. Um, and we have community afternoons often where students will have the choice to choose an activity that's relaxing and beneficial to them. And, and that's so different for so many of us. So taking a walk or taking a hike um, or just listening to music, you know, it's different for each of us. And we give the students opportunities to explore those options. 
And I lied, there's one more question I think is really important to cover because we really haven't talked about this at all um, and just want to sneak this one in. Um, we are concerned about the language requirement for a student with language-based struggles. How do you handle that and how many years is required? Um, so I'd love to have one, maybe Kelly or Josh talk about the requirement and then Agamemnon really talk about how he's worked with language here at CHCH. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about the requirement. So we do require all of our students to take two years of a language. Um, and that includes students who might, if they were going to public school, have a language waiver or something of that nature. Uh, essentially, I would say that we use um, a comprehensible input model uh, that's being more and more widely adopted across the country, um, which really focuses on real use of language and uh, a multi-sensory approach to language acquisition. And particularly in our first two years, we're really also interested in demonstrating kind of cultural competency and cultural fluency in our, for our students. So I, I guess part of this is that our, you know, our language classes are not the language classes that probably any of us who are adults on this um, webinar tonight went through or suffered through, as was my case, um, in high school. And, and, I, and I think that approach really helps our students be able to manage, even if they manage the two-year requirement. Um, but hey, I'd love to hear you talk about it and your experience with it. Um, so like before, when I went to like uh, for my uh, Carol, my other private school, I never really took any languages. So I was like really worried about it because I was like, well, how are they going to approach this? I don't, you know, I have trouble like reading English sometimes. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do Spanish. And, uh, you know, the teachers are really great. Um, they're really understanding. They really try to work with you on it. I mean, I'm only in Spanish too, but like, you know, they really helped me with it. Um, and I'm, I'm improving slowly but surely, but I'm improving at it. So. Thank you. I hope that answered your question and happy to expand um, offline as well. Um, thank you to all of our panelists um, for sharing your expertise with us and for Lois and Agamemnon for sharing uh, their experiences with us. Um, we will be posting this video. It, it has been recorded, so we will be following up with the recording as well as links on how to schedule an in-person or virtual tour and interview, um, as well as the application process. So thank you again. I hope everyone has a great night and thanks for joining us.